Okay, so let's uh, let's start. Uh, last lecture we saw that uh, current in a semiconductor has two components, one due to electrons and the other due to holes. And each one of these current components has two components here, one due to drift here, n mu and e. That's the first term which represents the drift current, and the second term which depends on the concentration gradient del n by del x dn diffusion constant. That's the diffusion part here. And similarly for the whole current, we have the drift part here and, uh, and, and the diffusion part over here. And we also said that uh, uh, the diffusion constant and the mobility are related together through the Einstein's uh, relationship, uh, which at room temperature d by mu is uh, kT by q, which is about, which is 26 uh, millivolt here. The other thing that we, when we looked at uh, last lecture, uh, we also said that in steady state, the current has to be constant throughout the semiconductor. Otherwise, uh, steady state implies that nothing is changing with respect to time. And if you don't have current which is constant throughout the device, you'll have either a pileup or a, uh, a, the charge in the device will change with time. And then that violates the definition of steady state here. The other thing, of course, we all know that if I'm talking about equilibrium, then equilibrium implies that current is equal to zero. There's no current, no current inside the device here. Okay, so this was the, uh, these were the, some of the equations and some of the concepts that we had seen in the last lecture, and we had seen one particular example. So today, let's see uh, how we can get some very useful uh, insights into a semiconductor with the help of these equations here. So another example, let's see. So here is a, uh, a semiconductor with two contacts, two ideal contacts here, and both sides are grounded, no net voltage applied here. There's no other excitation uh, to this particular semiconductor, so it's in equilibrium. This particular device is in equilibrium. And the question that I'm asking is, uh, is it possible that, uh, first of all, the hole density is much smaller than electron density, so we'll neglect it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, so we'll consider only electron de density here. Is it possible that the electron density inside the device goes like this here. That, that is 10 to the power 16. Uh, so it's not drawn directly underneath it, but what it sh says is that there is a part of the device where electron density is 10 to the power 16 constant, and then abruptly changes to 10 to the power 17 here. Is that possible? And if it's not possible, why? Why is it not possible? How do we answer it? Ten to the power sixteen till here. Let's say half of the device we are saying is ten to the power sixteen, and then abruptly changes to ten to the power seventeen. Okay. Okay. So is that possible or not? Not possible. How do we answer it? So, see, some of these things that you can, you know, you can uh, uh, use qualitative arguments and, and say whether it's possible or not, but also try to answer these questions through the equations. Okay. That's, that's you know, our, uh, uh, unless you have a lot of experience uh, uh, with the semiconductor, often your intuition may fail. Okay. Equations are a more reliable way of uh, answering these uh, uh, these questions here. So we can see this is the equation that we talked about, right? We, we just saw an expression for current. And we know current, because I don't have any holes in my system, holes are negligible. So current is basically equal to electron current. And we have an expression for current here. And because I've said equilibrium, no voltage is applied, no other excitation. So the net current is equal to zero. Fine. That's uh, that, that we know. Some of you are right. You said that this one, for example, here represents, if I look at this particular term here, del n by del x, it represents a, a, a infinite or very high value if, if, uh, uh, infinite uh, part here. Now, the net current is zero. What does that imply then? What does that imply? If this part is going uh, towards infinity here, dn dn by dx here is going to infinity and overall it has to be zero what does that imply yeah. q of n of course we know is finite 
everywhere is finite 10 power 16 to 10 power 17 so mobility is a finite parameter we said typical value for silicon let's say n type we can take as thousand so it implies e is infinite where will this infinite electric field come from then we don't see any source where i mean if you have a very high electric field you would require a very high value of charge because i don't i have not applied any voltage where is this infinite charge coming from there, there, there's there's no other source here okay so you're seeing that if you, you assume an abrupt change here you end up in a contradiction here you end up in a contradiction you cannot uh, uh, say uh, there's no source of such a high electric field inside the device and therefore this kind of an abrupt change is not possible so that um, uh, you know all of you saw an abrupt change like this uh, you know that uh, it would imply a an uh, an infinite diffusion current and very quickly even if you could let's say by some means arrange electron density like this here very quickly it would get smeared electrons from here would start going over to the other side here and and then the whole profile here will become more gradual right so th that we all see okay what about this 10 to the power 16 10 to the power 17 and a linear variation from this point to this point is that possible linear variation yes or no again how do we answer it we answer it again going back using the equation that's what i'm trying to tell you use the equations to arrive at the answers here so let's use the equation what equations do we know of again it is equilibrium the net current has to be zero okay so we start with this q n mu and e plus dn del n by del x has to be zero right so let's start with that what is it that i can compute huh I can very easily compute del n by del x would be 10 to the power 17 minus 16 divided by, I've not given you the length, but whatever is the L, we can calculate the uh, this one here. What is the direction of diffusion current? See, electrons will diffuse from higher concentration to lower, but the direction of the current would be opposite, right? So, and what is the diffusion current here at this point? Zero diffusion current here zero and here we can calculate if I tell you the length scale here you can calculate the diffusion current so will the diffusion current look like this agreed it will look like this zero then I have a it will jump up to some value here and it will be constant and then again drop to zero fine everybody agrees with that diffusion current will go like this here whatever the value uh, that would depend on the length scale now what else does this equation imply then before electric field what does this equation imply <coughs> this part is what <coughs> drift current what will happen to drift current then exactly equal and opposite right so i can draw the drift current here okay whatever is the value here the same here all right it goes like this now let's go step by step what does the drift current now imply here Let's use this equation here. N, do I know N everywhere in my system? Okay. Can I now calculate electric field? How will that look like? What would be the electric field here? Well, use this N mu and E. Drift current is zero. Electric field is zero. Drift current is zero. Electric field is zero. Right? Then after that, electric field is Jn drift divided by q n mu n here so zero electric field here suddenly it will jump up right it will jump to here value and then you can see n is increasing so electric field will decrease and then again jump back to zero here right exact variation we, uh, we, we are drawing only a qualitative variation here and of course i can determine the exact also right so that's the electric field okay does it make sense uh, that electric field should be negative because note we are talking about equilibrium equilibrium means no net movement of electrons right which means diffusion is pushing it towards the left and if i have electric field also negative the electric field will try to push it towards the right here and the two are balancing each other right so that's what you are getting here electric field is negative and trying to balance here now the issue was is this kind of a electron density profile possible now is this kind of an electron 
electrical uh, uh, electric field possible? Is it possible? What do we find? Electric field is zero and jumps up to some large value here. Abrupt change in electric field, what does it imply? Not just charge. Not just charge. Where do you see abrupt change in electric field here? Uh, which equation do we use to now relate electric field to charge? Hmm? Gauss's law, right? So uh, some of you may remember, we'll just in a minute discuss Gauss's law in more detail. Do you remember this? dE by dx is rho by epsilon. What is rho? Rho is volume charge density. So to get an abrupt change in electric field, what kind of a rho do you require? What kind of a row do you require? So that as I integrate from x equal to 0 minus to x equal to 0 plus, I get a change in electric field. What kind of a row do I want? A delta function. A delta function when you integrate over a negligible, you get a change. So you require a delta function here. What does this row then mean? It means that you have a sheet of charge. Is a sheet of charge. Where will this charge come from? Sheet of charge. All charges inside my semiconductor Inside my semiconductor are volume charges. Electrons are all distributed. Holes are all distributed. Everything is distributed. I can't have a source of sheet charge here. It's not possible. Delta function uh, charge here. So it's not possible to have an abrupt change in electric field. Inside the semiconductor, we will see no abrupt changes are uh, abrupt changes in electric field are not possible. Okay, unless somehow you could create. People do talk about a way of doping, which is like a delta doping. That, that, that is, you put a, a sheet of uh, donor atoms or acceptor atoms and all that. Unless there's a very, very specific situation where you have created that, you can't have a sheet charge here. All charges are distributed inside my semiconductor, and therefore I can't have that. I cannot have a uh, abrupt change in electric field like this here, which then implies what? I can't have a linear change like this here. It says that if you assume a linear change, it from there we are deriving that it ends up predicting an abrupt change in electric field and this abrupt change in electric field a discontinuity in electric field is not possible it's not possible given that i have only distributed charges i don't have a sheet charge inside my system here so what so this is this is not going to go like this what is we'll see later on what is more likely to happen is it goes like this gradually from here to here we'll see how it may go in this particular manner and electric field also will see it goes more gradually here. There's no abrupt change here. Starts from zero, gradually builds up, and then goes here. No abrupt change you would see. DE by DX anywhere is not infinite. You can't get that. Infinite DE by DX implies a sheet charge, okay, which is which is not possible in, in this kind of a system. Here. Now, something interesting uh, is also showing you something interesting now. So we know that there, there will be an electric field. Why? Because I have diffusion current. Whenever I'm going from higher concentration to lower concentration, I have an electron which is trying to diffuse from higher concentration to lower. And in order to counteract that, I must have an electric field. Okay. And the profile is, we don't know the exact profile, but we know that it will be zero somewhere here. It will gradually build up, then go again back to zero here. So it's going to go in some, some little bit more complicated fashion. Now, it's predicting something more interesting here. If you have an electric field like this here, what does it tell you about the potential at this point compared to potential at this point? What does it tell you? Say I take a point here, which is B, and I take a point here, which is A. What is it telling you the potential difference between A and B? Which one is at a higher potential? B is at a higher potential than A, right? Everybody's seeing that because I have a net electric field. I have an electric field which goes like this, psi b, psi is the what we'll use for internal potential, psi b is greater than psi a. This is at a higher potential as compared to uh, a here. Can we determine the value of uh, the potential difference? We don't know the electric field, by the way, right? We don't know, it's some complicated profile here. Can we determine psi b minus psi a? The answer is, even though I don't know the electric field, I can determine psi b minus psi a. How? Again, from this equation. See, a very simple equation, but there are a lot of insights that you can get from what is happening inside the device through this equation here. Again, we know that the current is zero. 
right? Everywhere in my device current is zero. It's equilibrium. So I'm going to take this equation and put it to zero, right? And then let's write this equation here. N, it implies N mu and E equal to minus dn del n by del x, right? Just separate it out, the two terms. Then what I'm going to do is E I'll write as minus del psi by del x. Okay, so we'll write that. And not only that, I'm going to take mu n towards this side here, dn by mu n, and I'm also going to take n towards the right hand side. Okay, so I'll get this equation here. d psi by dx equal to dn by mu n, 1 by n dn by dx. Note that the minus sign disappears because e is also minus del psi by del x. Okay, so I get this equation here. All right, so let's, let's continue with this equation here. Now what do I do? dn by mu n is kt by q, is a constant, right? At a particular temperature, 26 millivolts, so it's a constant. What else can I do? So d psi by dx is kt by q, d, see n I can take inside, d ln by dx here. Now can I integrate from a to b? What will I get if I integrate from a to b? Psi b minus psi a. And what will I get if I integrate from a to b? See, we are integrating here from this side. Will I get this psi b minus psi a equal to kt by q ln nb by na? Right? nb by na, that's what I'll get. And now let's put in the values here. See, I don't need to know the exact way in which electric field is going. All I needed to know are the endpoints. What is the electron density here? What is the electron density here? And I can from there predict that my point B here will be at a higher potential than point A. And I get a value here. If I put in now, let's say this is 10 to the power 17, this is 10 to the power 16 here. So I put in here, ln of 10 is about 2.3, kT by Q is 26 millivolt, multiplied together, you get 60 millivolt. So there's 60 millivolt potential difference between B and A. I get that answer, okay? Uh, just from using my simple equation, current equation, which says that the net current inside the device is zero. Okay? So what it is predicting then is the following. That, note that I have not applied any voltage. External voltage is zero. Voltage is here is zero and voltage here is zero. But what it is predicting is, if there is a change in electron density, any two points, if I find at equilibrium, let's say, point B is at a higher electron concentration as compared to point A, I'm finding that there has to be a potential difference between B and A. Because that potential difference will create an electric field which will balance the diffusion currents here. There will be a potential difference between B and A here. Now, what kind of a potential difference is this? There's an electric field also. We call this built-in voltage. It's not due to any external voltage there. This has come about because of internal dynamics, because of change in electron density from one point to the other. It's not because of any external voltage that you've applied. So that's why we call it a built-in voltage here. And also, there is a built-in electric field. So these are the concepts. So anytime you have a change in electron density, similarly, whatever I'm talking about, if you have a change in hole density, okay, you have a, uh, a built-in voltage or a built-in field inside the device. Here. Note something interesting. The point which has a higher electron density will have a higher voltage. I'm sure looking at this graph, <laughs> looking at this diagram, is, uh, some of you may, must be getting bothered here, right? I'm saying B is at a higher potential than A, and I have a ground here and I have a ground here. Am I violating uh, the Kirchhoff's voltage law, right? Uh, I must have a, if I start from zero, am I violating that? Uh, the answer is that you are not, because what happens is we'll see later on, you have a metal here, the metal is making contact to region A, which is 10 to the power 16 doping. And here you have a metal here, which is making a contact to a region B, which has 10 to the power 17 doping here. There are contact voltages, contact drops. There are contact drops, which you will see here. And it will turn out that the contact drop here, plus the drop here inside the semiconductor, plus the contact drop here, they'll all add up to zero. Mm. It's not, uh, even though the contacts, there is no contact drop, still we are not violating voltage drops. Because voltage law mm -hmm. only accounts for the current due to the electric fields. No, no, we are, what we are saying is uh, the sum of the voltages in a, in a loop. Sum of the voltages, mm -hmm. but we have to consider the voltage drop due to the current flow too. There's no current flow. There's no, there's no net current flow. No net current flow. Pitchhoff's law, law only accounts for the current which, which is caused by the electric field. 
No, no, no. Kerchoff's current law, uh, the voltage law, Kirchhoff's, uh, let's look at voltage law. The Kerchoff's voltage law is nothing but conservation of energy. That, that's what it is. So the sum of the drops, no, leave aside the current. What is the internal current, how it is flowing? What it says is, as I go in a loop, the sum of the voltage drops has to be zero. So if I'm, if I'm saying that there's an A region A here and a B here and there's a voltage drop here, and overall, if I go in a loop, there's no voltage drop. How is it possible? Listen, uh, I can always model the inner core of the semiconductor as a battery with a resistor. Battery with a? It's like the in internal voltage drop uh -huh. can be modeled as a battery uh -huh. and a resistance. Okay, so but how? If as you go around the loop, how is it uh, zero? Because in that case, there, there is a current flow. No, there's no current flow. That's what I'm saying. It's equilibrium. There's no current flow. There's no net current flow, there's still a drift current flow. Uh, no, 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 you, don't, you can't do that, drift or diffusion. What it says is there's no net current flow and therefore uh, 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 a battery and all that inside. I mean, yes, you, a built-in voltage is like an internal voltage, right? But then as you go around the loop, uh, drift and diffusion don't come there. What it says is as you go around in, in a loop, there has to be a conservation of Kirchhoff's law. is only a statement of conservation of energy, right? So as you go around in a loop, all the voltage drops have to add up to zero, irrespective of what is happening in this region, drift, diffusion, whatever. Uh, 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 you know, whether I have electron current, hole current, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so the drops have to add up to zero. And the way to explain this is, we'll show you later on that there is a drop here. There is a drop here. There is a drop here. See, why did a drop come, come about between region A and region B? I mean, yes, the, the internal we have seen drift and diffusion. Why? Because these are two different materials. Because one region has a doping of 10 power 16 and another region has a doping of 10 power 17. It's a very general statement that any time you take two different materials and you put them into contact, there is a contact drop. Any two, any, any two different materials will have a contact drop in between them. And therefore, we have a contact drop between here and this metal. And we have a contact drop between this region and this metal here. Okay, and we'll see that the contact drops depend on, uh, some of you may be familiar with the work function difference here. Work function of metal and a work function of semiconductor. We'll go into that later on when we come to metal semiconductor uh, junctions here. So, uh, so don't get bothered that uh, I have a drop here and, and the external voltage is zero. Yeah. Um, let's remove the contact mm -hmm. and place the semiconductor as it is. Mm -hmm. Place the semiconductor. I have a semiconductor piece. Right. Remove the contact. Remove okay. the grounding. Uh -huh. Place it as it is. Okay. What's the situation inside it now? What is the situation inside now? The potentials. The potentials are still psi A is uh, less than psi B. That means there is not exist a potential difference. Sure. There is. We are not saying there is no potential difference. There is a potential difference. It is there. Uh, uh, nobody is saying ki the, the drop is not there. It is there. It is very much there. In fact, uh, when we go into a PN junction, <laughs> And uh, in a PN junction also, as you may imagine, the uh, electron density at one side is very different from electron density at the other side. And there is a uh, same built-in voltage and we can measure these things. And when you, when you excite it, you get current and all of that. So it's, it's, it's not an artificial phenomenon, it's a real phenomenon. It, it's really there. Okay, so, so the other thing is the potential at B is higher than potential at A. Whenever you have a higher uh, carrier density as compared to uh, this particular point, you have a drop here. And by the way, this is only valid uh, at equilibrium. When you apply a voltage, of course, things get altered. Uh, but but psi B is at a higher potential than A uh, by this amount here. KT by Q, LN, NB by NA. Here. Okay. So the larger the uh, dense, uh, the difference between the carriers here and here, the more the potential difference. Okay, so that's another uh, very interesting thing that we get simply from the expression for current. Okay, let's come back. Uh, let's, uh, so with this, uh, this was one ex another example through which we, uh, I wanted to illustrate what uh, that uh, the insights that you can get just from the current equation. All right, as I said, our interest is in current versus voltage characteristics. Uh, understanding, getting current versus voltage characteristics in a device. And we, we've just seen that current is made up of two components. Uh, JN has drift and diffusion part. JP also has a drift and diffusion part here. And therefore, if I want to know my current versus voltage characteristics, of course, I'll have to determine JN and JP. And I see that in order to determine JN and JP, what I eventually require are three quantities. I require to know 
n inside my device, p inside my device and psi. If I know n and p and psi everywhere inside my device, of course, then I can easily determine jn and I can determine jp. I can add them up and I can get the uh, the current that is flowing inside my device here. But in fact, this is a much stronger condition. I don't have to know n, p, and psi everywhere inside my device. What I have to know is if you look at these equations, all I require is n del n by del x, p del p by del x, and del psi by del x at any point, at any single point inside my semiconductor. If I know this at any single point inside my semiconductor, then I can take these, put it in these, I can calculate jn, I can calculate jp, and I can get that. We just saw that in steady state, whatever is the current flowing in one part of the device, the same current flows throughout the part. So all I require is to determine current at one single point inside my device. If I can do that, then I can know current everywhere inside my, inside my device. And to do that, all I need to know is at any point, at any point inside my semiconductor device, if I can know n del n by del x, p del p by del x, and del psi by del x, my problem is solved. I know the IV characteristics of that particular device. So the issue is, where do I get this from? How do I obtain n, p, and del psi by del x? How do I obtain this for my device here? Okay. So the goal that I'm trying to say is, in order to get current versus voltage characteristics, I need these three quantities here. How do I obtain it? Well, we obtain it through the semiconductor equations that you see here. These are called the semiconductor equations. Two of them we have already seen. The expression for electron current and the expression for hole current. These are, these are two that we all know. Besides these, there are three other equations here. One of them is what we call as Poisson's equation, which relates potential to charges inside my semiconductor. The other one is continuity equation electron continuity equation that you see here and the whole continuity equation that you see over here. So these three, e e these three equations that are there along with the current ex uh, equations that you see here with these equations, I can, uh, these are the equations which I have to solve in order to arrive at these quantities, which then gives us a current versus voltage characteristic. See. In order to use these equations, if you will see, I require these terms are doping. So I need to understand doping inside my semiconductor here, uh, uh, donors and acceptors inside my semiconductor here. This one we'll just so soon see in a minute. This is refers to generation of electrons and this refers to recombination of electrons. So I need to understand generation and recombination of carriers inside my semiconductor. And of course, in order to use this equation, I need to understand transport, which is the mobility and the diffusion constants here. Okay. So these are the three additional things that we need to know besides the equations. And of course, if you look at the equations, the equations are all differential equations and we'll have to use the boundary conditions. As we solve them, we'll have to apply boundary conditions. Boundary conditions, of course, will come from the contacts and uh, other places. So we'll have to apply boundary conditions. And so the, the whole uh, analysis of semiconductor devices, what you're doing is you're solving these equations here. These equations here with appropriate boundary conditions and along with the material parameters and uh, dopings and generation recombination and mobility. Okay, so let's go and understand. We have already seen JN and JP, uh, the expressions for current here. Let's go and look at very quickly to, uh, with Poisson's equation and, and the continuity equation. All right, Poisson's equation is nothing but uh, uh, Gauss's law, del dot D equal to rho. Remember, rho is volume charge density, charge per unit volume. D, we can write it as uh, uh, epsilon times electric field here. So we can write del dot E equal to rho by epsilon. And uh, 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 all right, so we can write, del, uh, you know, in one dimension, uh, most of our analysis will be in one dimension. So del E by del X is rho by epsilon here. And then we write E equal to minus del psi by del X. And then we get del square psi by del X square equal to minus rho by epsilon. So that's the Poisson equation. It starts from? Uh, relationship between charge and electric field and all we do is write electric field as derivative of potential and we end up with this particular equation here. So that's something that you're all familiar with. What we'll do is just, we'll just simply expand it. We have seen that inside the semiconductor what you have is these electrons and you have holes, you have impurities which can be a donor atom and impurities which are acceptor atoms. Donor atoms will often be charged, positively charged, acceptor atoms would be negatively charged. So rho is what we can write inside a semiconductor as Q 
the positive charges are P plus ND plus here, uh, uh, ionized donor atom here, and the negative charges come from electrons and ionized acceptor atoms here, Na minus here. Now, in some, some places, you may have other uh, sources of charges, other impurities besides these donors and acceptors. So in that case, one can add those as well here. Okay, but uh, typically, these are the sources of charges. So we can write then the Poisson's equation as del square psi by del x square minus Q by epsilon P plus ND plus minus N minus N. Okay, so it relates the electric field and potential to the electron and hole density inside a semiconductor. All right, so that's uh, Poisson's equation. Let's, so that's something which is easy to understand. Let's come to the continuity equation here. So it's a partial differential equation that you see here. This just says that del N by del T is 1 over Q, del J N by del X, derivative of electron current with respect to X, generation of electrons per unit volume per second, recombination of electrons per unit volume per second. Okay, so these are the terms here. So let's see where this equation comes from. It's nothing but arise from simply cons conservation equation here. All you're doing is you're counting how many particles are generated, how many particles are uh, dying, how many particles are coming in, how many particles are going out. So all that you're doing is you're simply keeping bookkeeping. Okay, so let's, let's see how one does that. So let's take a small piece of semiconductor. Let's say from X to X plus delta X here, small piece here. The cross-sectional area is A. And the electron density in this small region here is Nx. Okay. All right. Now, the total number of electrons in this particular volume will be, remember, N is all electron density per unit volume. So Nx times the volume of this particular region here, which is area multiplied by delta X. Here. So that's the total number of electrons that are there in this particular volume. Now, what can cause the num total number of electrons to increase or decrease in this particular volume? Let's ask that question. What can cause changes in the total number of electrons in this? We'll assume that A is a constant. We are not changing the area. Delta X is a constant. So now, what can cause N to change? Well, one of the things that you can imagine is in a semiconductor, I have current flowing. So I have electron, electron current is coming in, electron current is going out, right? So I can write like this. Different processes that can alter N are, one of them is electron current, okay? I can have INX here, and I can have INX plus delta X. Here. More electron, uh, let's say, less electron coming in, more going out, or more coming in, less going out. So that could be one which could alter the number of electrons in this particular volume. Here. Okay? How do how do I find out what is the change in uh, the total number of electrons? Let's do that. The change in total number of electrons in this particular volume, delta N, in a small time interval, delta T will be equal to these many electrons are coming in, these many are going out, INX minus INX plus delta X divided by 1 over minus Q because we are talking about electrons. Okay, so if I divide it by minus Q, that, that tells me how many electrons came in, how many electrons went out, and the balance, of course, is what happened. They accumulated there, right? So total change in the number of electrons in this volume in a small time interval delta T will be given by Delta N will be equal to delta NX. There has to be a change in electron density because A and delta X are constant, <coughs> right? So we can rearrange this equation. We start with this equation, just simply rearrange now. Uh, a uh, uh, Delta X, uh, we can rearrange here. So we can say delta NX, delta T, take it over this side. Delta NX by delta T, A here. And then you can write it as del N by del T equal to one over Q, del J N by del X. So that's one source that can cause change in electron density in that particular volume here. So we get the first term, okay? All due to change in electron current here because the electron current is varying uh, with X and therefore I have that results in change in electron density. Okay, different processes that can alter N. We said electron current is one. I can have generation of electrons inside my uh, semiconductor and I can have also electrons recombining recombining with holes here. So let me illustrate that. So in general, I will have electrons and I will have all these holes here. So what may be happening is because of thermal generation, I have one electron hole pair being generated here. I, I get one electron and a one hole. I may get another electron and a hole here. So this is what we are talking about is generation. Generation is occurring all the time because of the thermal energy. Generation can also occur. For example, if you shine light, 
the photons will get absorbed and they will create electrons and holes. So there are multiple sources of generation here. So that's what we mean here. So generation can alter the number of electrons inside my system. The other one is recombination. What is happening is note one electron and one hole recombined together and got lost. Okay. One electron, one hole recombined and got lost here. So that's what we are referring to as recombination, death of an electron here. And this is the generation of electron here. So these are the three processes that can alter the electron density inside a volume. Electron current, more coming in, less going out, uh, generation of electrons and recombination of electrons here. So let's, let's add these other terms here. So we've already seen what is the change in electron density as a result of as a result of the different uh, the change in the electron current that is flowing here let's add the generation and recombination terms here so when we talk about generation this is what we mean here generation rate refers to number of carriers generated per unit volume per unit time okay that's that's the meaning of generation rate here note per unit volume per unit time so some number divided by centimeter cube in second here similarly recombination is number of carriers recombining per unit volume per unit time here so that's the units here so then what i can do is i can add a generation term here and subtract a recombination term gn minus rn here okay so i add a generation term that results in increase in the number of electrons inside that particular volume and recombination results in decrease in the number of carriers inside that particular volume okay and that completes my continuity equation so it's nothing but a all that you're doing is bookkeeping what is happening to the number of electrons inside that particular layer and 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 what can cause it to change so current is one source a a change in current inside the device generation of electrons and recombination and same thing you can write now for it a, a hole as well here the only thing is the hole and electron differ in the charge here so you get a minus uh, one over q here and same gp minus rp generation rate of holes recombination of uh, rate of uh, uh, holes here okay so we end up getting an electron continuity equation and we get up we get a whole continuity equation all right so that's uh, these are the semiconductor equations then electron current whole current whole continuity equation electron continuity equation poisson's equation right so these are the equations that we'll encounter again and again and our goal is what to use these equations to calculate n del n by del x p del p by del x del psi by del x somewhere inside the device here okay if we know n p and psi everywhere inside the device that's very nice okay but to just simply arrive at current calculate a value of current you only need it at one particular point okay and so these are the additional things that we require here that you see and of course we'll have to apply boundary conditions because these are differential equations okay so let's look at it. So these equations are there. Let's look at a very specific uh, case of uh, solving these equations. And that is no matter which device I take, uh, the simplest situation that arises is when I don't apply any voltage. When I don't apply any voltage, when I have no other external excitation, I have a case which we call as thermal equilibrium. <laughs> okay, the device is in equilibrium. And this is what thermal equilibrium implies, that there is no electron or hole current. Obviously, there's no total current, but there's also no net electron current or no net hole current here. Jn x equal to zero everywhere. Jpx equal to zero everywhere. Okay. All right. Individual need not be zero. I may have a drift current. We just saw an example of I had a drift current and I had a diffusion current. Both of them were canceling each other here. Individual currents need not be zero. Individual drift electron current or a diffusion electron current need not be zero. But net electron current has to be zero. Net whole current has to be zero. And obviously the sum is zero here. So anytime you have thermal equilibrium, you have these conditions here. You always, obviously, you have steady state. There's nothing in, in your uh, semiconductor which is changing with respect to time. You take N, P, uh, what, uh, whichever quantity is of interest, nothing is changing with respect to time. Steady state. This we will see later on. Uh, the constant Fermi energy we'll see later on. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, Right now, I've not introduced the concept of Fermi energy, so let's, uh, uh, let's ignore that for a moment. Here. All right. So this is then. Uh, these are the conditions that are prevalent 
at thermal equilibrium here. Now, as I said, the electron current is zero and the whole current is also zero here. So we have this equation, n mu and e equal to minus dn del n by del x. Okay. We've already seen that e we can write as minus del psi by del x. And therefore, this equation we can write as del psi by del x equal to dn by mu n into ln uh, derivative of ln n uh, with respect to the, uh, x here. So we, we've already seen this equation here. What this equation is implying, if you look at it, is implying that log of n, because this is a constant, is implying that log of n is linearly related to psi or n is exponentially related to psi. That's what it is implying. So we'll see, we'll derive this equation that in equilibrium, you can see it from here that psi is linearly related to log of n. And from there, we'll derive that n in equilibrium will be equal, will be related directly to the potential. Here. You can see the relationship here, uh, uh, you know, but you can't see all the constants and all that. So we'll derive this later on to show you that N0, N0 refers to electron density in equilibrium. We've added a zero to indicate that this relationship is not valid all the time, only in equilibrium. That N0 is related exponentially with psi. And similarly, P0 is exponentially related to psi. Here. Okay. Uh, there, there has to be a minus term here. Yeah. This is what thermal equilibrium means. And no current, no voltage is applied, no external excitation. At a fixed temperature, a fixed temperature no thermal gradients, nothing. Okay? Uh, this is what it implies here. Okay, but in, in a semiconductor, thermal equilibrium in physics can mean, uh, 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 let's not get into that, but in the context of semiconductor, what I mean is no external excitation, either voltage or optical or whatever. No external excitation. And, 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 and then this is what it, it, it would, it implies here. Okay. All right. So if we go back, then there's something interesting that you see here. Okay. So I use this equation and from there, uh, the fact that it is zero, we show that n is related to psi here. Okay. Which means, and uh, don't worry about it. As I said, we'll derive these equations and we'll show n zero p zero is equal to n i square and all that later on. What it says is n is related to psi, which means, and similarly, I can show that p is related to psi, right? So what does this imply? It implies that out of n, p, and psi, how many independent quantities do I have? Hmm? n is related to psi, p is related to psi. So I have only one independent quantity, okay? So in equilibrium, the problem is much more simpler. All I have to do, if you look, go, at, go and look at these equations here, my net current is zero, Jn is equal to zero, Jp is also equal to zero. Fine. So this is zero and this is zero. Then if I go and see, what about del n by del t in equilibrium? We said steady state, nothing is changing with respect to time, del n by del t is zero. Del Jn by del x, Jn is zero. So del j, this term is also zero. If this is zero, this is zero, generation must be balancing the recombination. I, you know, at any temperature, I will have thermal carriers, carriers being generated. They must be balancing. So Gn equal to Rn. Same thing happens, Gp equal to Rp. So in some sense, these equations become trivial. All the terms are zero. Okay? All the terms are zero. Gn is equal to zero. Jp equal to zero. The only equation that is meaningful at uh, thermal equilibrium is this equation here. Del square psi by del x square is Q by epsilon P0 minus N0 ND plus minus NA minus N. And as I said, P0 and N0 are related to psi. So the whole equation is in terms of psi. One single equation in terms of psi or in terms of potential. If you solve this particular equation, what will you get? You'll get potential everywhere inside the device. Right? Potential everywhere inside the device. And if you know potential everywhere inside the device, you will know N0 everywhere in the device. You'll know P0 everywhere in the device. And the problem is solved. You know, all, all uh, obviously net current is zero. And, and, and therefore, you have solved the, uh, uh, all the uh, uh, equations that are there. I mean, uh, all that you wanted to know about a device in equilibrium, you looked in simply from the Poisson's equation. Okay. So any questions? Any questions regarding the equations?